There's a joke going around. It, it has probably gone around too often now about Descartes going into a bar and having a drink. And when the bartender asks if he'd like another one, Descartes says, I think not, and disappears. And this is a joke that's designed to convey the, if uh, not philosophical subtlety, then the philosophical frivolity of Descartes doubting his own existence until he could come up with a good reason for it, namely, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Well, actually, there isn't very much that's frivolous in Descartes, and his philosophical power is a matter of record. In fact, on some accounts, it is with Descartes, 1596 to 1650, that the modern period of philosophy is said to begin. Descartes was among the most uh, fertile, Descartes' imagination was among the most fertile in the scholar's pantheon. He's the recognized founder of analytical geometry. He made important contributions to optics and physiology. His mother had died within a year of his birth. The grandmother, who then took responsibility for him, would pass on when Descartes was 10 or 11, whereupon he was enrolled in the new Jesuit school at La Fleche, paced, placed there for nine years, and paced through a rigorous Jesuit curriculum. He then earned a law degree at Poitiers, wrote a brief manual on fencing, and at 22 he fought as a mercenary in the Dutch Army's War of Independence against, against Spain. This service introduced him to a prominent Dutch mathematician, Isaac Beekman, who encouraged the young genius to compose a mathematically based treatise on music. The next year, 1619, still fired by the spirit of adventure, Descartes appears as a mercenary in the army of the Duke of, ba of Bavaria. And it was at this time that Descartes had three vivid dreams, which he took to be a summons to him personally to create an original and daring path to knowledge, a mirabilis scientiae fundamenta. Well, from the years in the Jesuit boarding school when his physical condition caused him to be assigned a room of his own, and long morning hours to regain his strength, to his many years of healthy and active life, Descartes was a morning dreamer. He would remain in bed, meditating on things Cartesian, often to the alarm and the frustration of housekeepers. His celebrity caused him to change res residences often, just so he could work in splendid solitude. But he was also in regular correspondence with the leading lights of the European intellectual and scientific world and was seen by them as a force to be reckoned with. I say his dates are 1596 to 1650. So he is alive in 1600 when Giordano Bruno is burned at the stake. He's already a productive and busy scholar and scientist in 1633 when Galileo will be called before the Inquisition. Thus does Descartes live in intellectually and politically dynamic times and he's very much at once the product and one of the sources of a momentous period in intellectual history. Now what about this cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am? Not a morning person, Descartes was, we can assume, on his back in bed, staring at the ceiling, conjuring all, all sorts of philosophical and mathematical possibilities, in a word, thinking. Now as we learn from his Rules for the Direction of the Mind, not published till more than 30 years after his death, quote, only those objects should engage our attention to the sure and indubitable knowledge of which our mental powers seem to be adequate, close quote. So here is a scholar desperate to avoid the Scylla and Charybdis through which he must navigate that philosophical skiff that will be his life's work, the Scylla and Charybdis of mere opinion, of all that is transitory or merely customary, of all that is but rank mysticism, superstition, prejudice. What he finds in the scholastic lessons of his early Jesuit schooling is a logical rigor, but one that has no power of discovery. What he finds in Renaissance science is marred by magic and witchcraft and hocus-pocus, dogma posing as knowledge. But to avoid this may well find the scholar insensibly falling prey to skepticism. So Descartes, like Francis Bacon, is looking for a method. How does one find the right method that will spare one from self-deception and superstition, but also from the melancholy state of the total skeptic? 
How Descartes set about to accomplish this is summarized in two monumentally influential works published four years apart. His Discourse on Method, which appeared in 1637, and his Meditations on First Philosophy, published in 1641. The Discourse on Method was written in French. He explains his rationale. By writing in French, he says, quote, the language of my country, he is able to address an audience not already committed to the wisdom of the ancients, as are Descartes' teachers. In French, the discourse was indeed accessible to a wide audience, and one that could only have been attracted immediately on reading these opening lines, quote, Good sense is of all things in the world the most equally distributed, for everybody thinks himself so abundantly provided with it that even those most difficult to please do not commonly desire more than they already possess. The power of forming a good judgment and of distinguishing the true from the false is by nature equal in all men. But to be possessed of good mental powers is not sufficient. The principal matter is to apply them well." Close quote. Ah, the diversity of opinions and the constant tendency toward error arise not from unequal or insufficient rational power, but from faulty methods of inquiry and discovery. It is the purpose of the Discourse on Method to reveal how Descartes himself has fashioned a mode of inquiry designed to save himself from such errors. As he says, he's not proposing something that all must follow. Rather, as something of an intellectual autobiography, he will share with readers what has worked for one man, who just happens to be René Descartes. Well, this would be as if Albert Einstein wrote a treatise on how to think about problems in physics and then noted that it's, well, you know, just my way of doing it. There are, to be sure, any number of candidate methods available, and Descartes summarizes them. He's a student of the history of ideas. He knows what's been tried before. His most illustrious contemporaries are products of intellectual history and largely so faithful to the ancients as to be addicted to ancient conclusions. The problem with history, as a guide, is that a man who spends too much time in a distant land becomes a stranger in his own country, says Descartes. The problem with the study of history is that it simply removes one from the very context in which the insistent demands for knowledge are indeed most insistent. History is a guide but it's not an answer. No two historical events are ever precisely the same anyway, such that all that one could glean from that kind of inquiry would be generalities subject to interpretation and indeed endless disagreement. Well, what about vaunted philosophy? Could there be a better method than the philosophical method? But of course, philosophy doesn't have a single method, and in any case, if you consult the great philosophers of history, the salient fact that emerges is that they scarcely agree with each other on any major point. So indeed, if philosophy were a reliable guide to the truth, the long debate would have been concluded a long time ago. Now what about mathematics, the queen of the sciences? Now, uh, at least, and he, Descartes, is a great mathematician, well, at least that when a problem is solved mathematically, you know it. Unfortunately, those problems are at a level of abstraction so removed from the facts of the physical world and our place in it that it's not entirely clear you really can match them up with reality at all. There isn't anything wrong with mathematics, but in a certain sense there also isn't anything really right about it as a method of inquiry. It's majestic as a method of analysis, an abstract method of representation, but alas, not as a method of discovery. For Descartes, these limitations lead to a different approach. For him, the right method begins with an utterly skeptical disposition. The right method should begin with a profession of ignorance. Not only don't I know anything, but I'm positioned in such a way that what I think I know is probably laden with error, misapprehension, and confusion. So it's with this orientation that one committed to accepting nothing unless it can prevail on me as an idea of such power and clarity and indubitability that I'm simply powerless to doubt it, this is how Descartes wants to proceed. Descartes adopts the highest standard that must be met by anything presented as an object of knowledge. Anything that fails to satisfy that standard, he says, he's prepared to reject. 
Now, the standard essentially rules out all the objects of perception, for all such, such objects might well be products of delusion or hallucination. Here we confront what might be called Descartes' worst case scenario, and I quote from Descartes' first and second meditations here, quote, I shall then suppose some evil genius has employed his whole energies in deceiving me. I shall consider that the heavens, the earth, colors, figures, sound, and all other external things are naught but the illusions and dreams of which the genius has availed himself in order to lay traps for my credulity. I shall consider myself as having no hands, no eyes, no flesh, no blood. Was I not then likewise persuaded that I did not exist? Not at all. But there is some deceiver or other, whoever employs his ingenuity in deceiving me, then without doubt I exist also if he deceives me." Close quote. That is, if there really is an evil demon or malignant being setting out to deceive Descartes, well, now, the, now, now things that I've talked about in relation to his, my own body, nutrition, walking, hearing voices, all the things Descartes could be saying, seeing colors, hearing sounds, is there anything in any of the attributes of that sort, the attributes of materiality, material things, things accessible to the senses, anything there that belongs to the nature of body that couldn't come into the purview of an evil demon setting out to deceive me? Clearly not. I could always be deceived, says Descartes, about all things like that. I might be dreaming that I'm walking instead of actually walking. I might be hallucinating, the victim of post-hypnotic suggestion, in a stupor that has me imagining things I'm not engaged in. All such things are just the province of a malignant demon setting out to deceive me. Perceptions and feelings aside, there is, however, another activity in the soul that is thinking. And here is Descartes again, quote, Thinking is another attribute of the soul, and here I discover what properly belongs to myself. This alone is inseparable from me. I am therefore, precisely speaking, only a thinking thing, that is, mind or reason." Close quote. Let us rehearse this. Properly speaking, I am a thinking thing. I am a race cogitans. I cannot say with comparable epistemic authority that I am an extended thing, a race extensa, because when it comes to things like I walk, I'm tall, my eyes are blue, well these are things that clearly could be subject to self-deception or deception imposed by a malignant demon setting out to deceive me. So it turns out then that the one thing I can count on as being so inseparably bound up with the reality of my being is thought, cogito, I think. In this, however, I cannot be deceived, for only in so far as I am a thinking thing, only in so far as I think, only to that extent am I subject to deception. One might not ever be able to distinguish between reality and a dreamed reality. All empirical modes of verification are, after all, vulnerable to demonic deception. Nothing external to the mind can count against this demon theory, but to deceive logically entails some sort of cognitive agent, a thinking thing, a race cogitans. Now this is the point of the cogito ergo sum. The cogito ergo sum is not a device Descartes needs in order to deduce his existence. It's not as if he disbelieves his own existence and must find some evidence for it. The cogito, in a word, is not designed to solve an ontological problem, but an epistemological problem, the problem of finding a means, a method, by which to be sure one is not deceived. What Descartes searches for is the necessary precondition even for total skepticism. And this turns out to be thought itself, or more generally, the reality of the mental, which is affirmed even in the act of doubting it. Thus, it is an act of mind that constitutes the root ontological reality, providing just that clear, undeniable, inseparable aspect of being that must defeat all and every form of skepticism. There cannot be a complete skepticism regarding knowledge because the one thing I can know is that I am a thinking thing. Now something very interesting comes out of this other than the argument itself. Descartes did not discover his method by having the prescription of his glasses changed or by way of Baconian experimental lucifera. 
He arrived at his discovery through a form of rational ana analysis, a kind of axiomatic method, not unlike what one finds in mathematics and analytical geometry. So here we find Descartes, the analytical geometer, the student of Euclid, putting together a rational argument, or if I may say, a distinctly, yes, Jesuitical argument, one leading to a conclusion capable of sustaining a particular position and defeating another one. Does this method remind us of something else? A method that begins with a thesis, followed by good reasons for doubting its validity, followed by rational replies to these very objections, and then resting the conclusion on what the argument presents with clear and compelling force? Does it not echo the sick et known of medieval philosophy? You know, Descartes is widely regarded as the father of modern philosophy. I should say that this may be so, but I also suggest that he is the last of the great scholastic philosophers. Now, consider the method again, the discourse on method. It's a veritable avenue into the world of modern philosophy. There are four main points set forth in the work. First, except nothing is true, except what presents itself with a clarity and vividness that is irresistible. Secondly, divide each problem into as many smaller steps as possible. That is, when you address the problem of knowledge, what is it I know, what can be known, how do I go about knowing, try to partition that into as many small steps as you can. Third, work from the solution of the smallest step up to the ever larger and larger aspects of the problem so that finally you reach the general solution. You reach the general solution by working through solutions to the more rudimentary and elementary dimensions of the problem. Finally, test the general solution with persistence. Go after it hammer and tong, assuring yourself that it suffers no exceptions. As with Bacon on the fruit-bearing kind of experiment, Descartes, too, anticipates a falsificationist criterion in the search for knowledge. We must test the general solution with persistence, assuring ourselves that it suffers no exceptions. So what we're really looking for is the exception to the general rule. Any number of empirical confirmations won't be enough. Rather, search for a test that would really show the weakness of the general solution that you've found. Now, fortified with the method of inquiry, Descartes would then turn his attention productively to what comes down to us as philosophy of mind. After all, if it is the mind, if it is mental activity that stands at the root ontological fact, the root ontological fact that cannot be denied, then we must know something about mind and its operations, mind in relation to body, the nature of the relationship between a race cogitans and a race extensa. This, of course, is a vexing question. Some have argued that Descartes was the first to recognize its full import, that, that the ancients had no idea that there really was a mind-body problem as such. Aristotle and Plato were well aware of the difference between mind and body. Indeed, I think Aristotle was deeply aware of the problem of just how the two become related. He does say that there's something about our rational power that doesn't seem to have one of the properties of matter, namely movement, what makes a thing a material thing is that, at least in principle, it's changeable or movable. So when Aristotle says in his treatise on the soul that epistemonikon ukine tai, that the rational faculty doesn't move, he does seem to be at least creating the grounds for an argument according to which there is an immaterial aspect to the mental. Now this doesn't, of course, solve the mind-body problem, but it surely offers evidence that at least one ancient Greek was aware that there was a problem. Nonetheless, in Descartes, the mind-body problem really is pivotal. The question is how an unextended thing can make an extended thing move. If you take Descartes as insisting that the mind is not an extended thing, but a thinking thing, that essentially what we are are thinking things, which is to say that the mind is not an extended material object, well, it's not at all clear how a mental event can produce or bring about or cause a physical event. How, for example, my decision to raise my arm is followed by my arm going up. Now, volitionally, I can bring about the movement of my arm, which is to say there's some sort of mental event followed by a physical event, which means something mental, in some sense, is making something physical happen. Well, Descartes doesn't really know any way around this. He's fairly confident that the soul, elan, soul, mind, is able to make the body move. 
but he certainly is not prepared to grant that something about the body can cause the mind to think. It's clear and indubitable as an idea that I have the intention to raise my arm. There's nothing doubtful about the first person account of a desire. There is then nothing doubtful, at least to me, about my arm going up because I willed it. So there's nothing odd in the claim that the mental causally brought about the physical, that mind caused body to move. However, it would be at once odd, surely doubtful, to claim that the movement of the arm caused one to think. It would be comparably odd to think that matter as such could causally influence the mental as such. Well, Descartes' solution to the mind-body problem is a limited interactionist solution. He does see how the psychic dimension or the mental dimension of life can bring about physical effects, but he does not grant that the mere physics of body can bring about genuinely mental events. He knows, of course, that physical injuries can cause psychological experiences of pain, that an empty stomach creates pangs of hunger, that light results in visual sensations. But such effects are not the purely mental events that Descartes takes to be the authentic marks of the mental. Rather, only abstract rational thought, uh, what one finds in mathematics and logic, for example, would qualify as mental in the stricter, I would say, Cartesian sense. In fact, I think the best way of illustrating what Descartes does have in mind in declaring that a race extensa cannot determine a race cogitans is this. He raises the specific question about a conceivable machine. Now, he has formidable engineering skills himself and was also one of the many to be amused in the royal gardens by the dancing statues that were activated by stepping on some concealed plate in the ground. He regarded these as very good models of sensory and motor functions. The same principles might well account for how we and the entire animal economy respond to impinging stimuli. The external world stimulates sense organs, thus setting up patterns of activity. The patterns of activity are carried by some kind of spiritus uh, medium through the what he called the nervous tubules. When the nervous tubules in the arm fill up, the arm is pulled one way or another way, depending upon which muscles are thus stretched, etc. So Descartes was satisfied that most of the sensory, motor, emotional, appetitive dimensions of life could be explained according to such hydraulic or physical or mechanical principles. Indeed, in these respects, he really is one of the founders in the modern sense of a rigorously biological psychology. But now, let's get back to his thought uh, experiment uh, about a marvelous machine. Descartes asks whether we could make something that so closely approximates our behavior that we really couldn't tell it from an actual person. He's raising a question that today would be called the question of artificial intelligence. And Descartes says, he answers the question, no. Uh, such a device would always fail, and it would fail in the following ways. First, it would never attain the idea of God. Second, it would not be able to frame abstract concepts. And it could not creatively use language. Now this is just another way of saying that the mark of our rationality, the mark of a thinking thing, is to be found in the rational, creative, and discursive powers, not at the level of perception, feeling, or behavior. It's to be found in the rational power of abstract thought, particularly as this manifests itself in mathematics. And indeed, it is to be found in that ultimate degree of abstract thought in which we contemplate the created universe as the outcome of transcendent powers beyond the reach even of reason, let alone sense. So Descartes famously solves the mind-body problem by granting that the mind has an independent standing. Descartes is routinely also credited, or charged, however you like it, uh, with holding something called a theory of innate ideas. Now, actually, he went so far as to publish a document declaring that he had never proposed such a theory. But ideology has a way of generating lies and libels in every arena of life, and Descartes has been the victim of some fairly odd attributions. Now, in a manner of speaking, Descartes did have a theory according to which some things that are obviously and universally known, and that could not possibly be known as a result of sensory experience, can only be accounted for on the basis of there being some innate 
or intuitive or, as it were, a priori mental power. He makes the point in several ways. Let's consider one especially vivid example of what, in a very qualified sense, might count as a Cartesian innate idea. Suppose we assume that all knowledge of the external world is by way of the activity of the sense organs. Every empiricist would like that. The old scholastic bromide, nihil est in intellectu, quod non fuerit prius in sensu. Nothing is in the mind which wasn't first in the senses. That expresses the point well. So anything that possibly can constitute an item of thought begins as a sensory experience. Surely Descartes' sternest critics would take that position. So all we could possibly know then are our own experiences, flashes, shapes, forms, sounds, tastes, touches, odors, various combinations of all these. But notice, if that's all that could possibly occupy the mind, namely the sensory experiences, there would be absolutely no basis whatever to assume that there is an external material world that is causally bringing these sensations about. It would be unthinkable for creatures thus equipped to reach the conclusion that in addition to sights, sounds, smells, touches, etc., there's also some separate external material reality causally antecedent to all these experiences. Nonetheless, everyone in fact does know that sensations and perceptions are consequences of an external material world impinging on the organs of sense. Nobody's doubtful about an external material world, known as a material world. Put all this together. Everyone knows there's an external material world. No one could arrive at the idea of matter as such from the phenomenology of experience, for thoughts and sensations have no material or physical attributes. How then, from the facts of experience, do we reach the understanding or possess the certain knowledge that the experiences are, some, are of something which in fact is a material something? Now since matter, qua matter, is not something delivered by the senses, the only thing delivered by the senses are these psychic experiences, and since everyone knows that there is an external material world causally effective in bringing these perceptions about, well, the idea of matter must be something imminent in thought itself. It isn't served up by experience, so it must, must be one of the intuitively provided facts of mental life. Now, I don't wish to defend Descartes' conclusions here. I simply want to show that this new method begins as skepticism. It uses reason and rational argument in a systematic way, and it presents as the right approach to solving the problem of knowledge an axiomatic analytical approach characteristic of developments in mathematics and now being brought to bear more generally on the affairs of life and mind. The modern age is upon us. It is replete with new and different interests in the subtle operations of the mind itself. And we've come a long way toward the recognition and the appreciation that in the interstices of a rich cognitive life, much of what we take to be facts of the external world really turn out to be echoes and reflections, models of a possible world shaped and conditioned by the peculiarities, the eccentricities, and the formal properties of cognition, of a cognizing being, as a race cogitans. Cartesianism is held up to scorn, ridicule, and analysis seven days a week in good philosophy departments and any number of PhD dissertations, At the end of the day, there is a very, very strong Cartesian element in what we are pleased to call our cognitive neuroscience and our philosophies of mind. Descartes is with us, even as his methods look a bit antiquated in comparison with the functional MRI. We are Cartesian, even when we are so kicking and screaming.